All right, let's get down to the road to the Undisputed Heavyweight Championship, Chapter 4, the IBO, the history of the Undisputed Heavyweight Championship in boxing, ladies and gentlemen. Competition is at its highest. The IBF has been in struggles due to the ratings and the scandalisms in the late 90s and 2000s, which is a story I've already told you viewers about, about the, IB, the FBI being involved. We already talked about how the WBO became a major belt and how this or that and how we how it got to be there in the first place. We talked about how the WBC took a long time for the WBC to get fit in with all the title changes and everything else and how there were so many fluke champions from Deontay Wilder to Tyson Fury. And I do feel like Vidui Klitschko was the only one that was more prestigious of that title during the time from 1999 to 2024. And probably a little bit of that Russian fighter. But that has nothing to do with this. Now we get to the IBO Heavyweight Championship. Now guys, I don't want to spoil this for you viewers, but here's the thing. The IBO belt has been held by November 13th, 1999, since Lewis defeated Holyfield. I've said that a bunch of times already. And during the time when Usyk did win, and when he did win the belt in 2021 and such, and we'll get... Mostly to that, which I'm not. From April, from May the 18th, 2024, as he won the belt, as he still retained it with Tyson Fury and the Undisputed. To be honest, guys, from there to that, the past to the present, the belt has only been held by not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, but only seven fighters it's from 1999 to 2024. And in all fairness, guys, when you look at the picture and look at the, um, well, probably the backstory of it, uh, to be honest, betwixt you and me, the IBO has only been in held for quite a dozen times. Just not too much. And what I mean by that is that the belt has not been in the line as much. But guys, here's the, here's the story I wanted to talk about. Now, the IBO has been around since 1988, the same year when the WBO was a thing. Uh, it's been in a private-type organization a little bit, but even though it's in headquarters in uh, Coral Gables, Florida, as of right now, with President Ed Levine. If you want to know who he is, technically, I don't want to say too much because who cares who the president is? Well, I do care about who the president of the WBA is, but that will be for another time. So um, the history goes that the foundation came incorporated in Illinois in 1988, um, but by 1992, or, or since the IBO was founded and incorporated in Illinois, formerly in Illinois in 88, but in 1992 by John W. Dadono former president. And of course, the organization would later move to Florida in 1997, incorporated in Florida at the time with Ed Levine as well, who continues to serve the organization as of today. So he's been involved with it even before the undisputed champion in 1999. There is more information I will say about the IBO and the stuff I will say, but here's the two things I do love about the IBF. One, I love how the organization implemented a computerized system for the independent world boxing rankings because by 1995, the internet, the government already released the Windows 95 and gave us the world of internet to the public and such. And that was the time and you think to yourself, well, we might as well use this system to have all fans and people like myself to look up these ratings. And to this day... I've been doing it ever since. I was only born in 1998, three years after, so I think it makes sense why I was into the internet world. But still, my point is they used it as an independent thing in the late 90s that, that removed the subjective elements from the ratings in an effort to bring more credibility to the sport. That's one thing I do like about the IBF. Even from 2014, the organization now employs BoxRec, which is something I'm still I'm on my computer as of right now, and I'm already looking at it as of now, as the independent boxing records keeper as computerized rankings website to produce IBO rankings. 
even though the IBO does permit one world champion by per weight division, which is a second thing I do like the most. I like that they don't have interim belts, they don't have regular belts, not like the WBO, the IBF, and the WBA have been doing. I think the WBC has it. Yes, the WBC also has an interim championship belt as well because David Benavides has been holding on to it. And he's also going to the white heavyweight next month. But that's for a whole other time. But, but, you, but you get what I mean. I like that the IBO is only doing one championship per weight division. Because they had they've, they've, they've never, they've never put in more than one champion, as nor will they, because... Mostly that is one thing I will give credit to. Fun fact. In addition, the world champions of the IBO does recognize regional championships, including the Intercontinental Championship. If an Intercontinental um, IBO Intercontinental Champion has been successfully defended his title three times, he may receive a mandatory opportunity for a world title. Which I kind of like that idea. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure some people will disagree with it, but... I like the aspect that just because these belts are a waste of time, but guys, the world IBO, world youth, the Mediterranean, the Oceania, Orient, the international, intercontinental, continental, European, Asia Pacific, America's title, et cetera, et cetera. Like all the titles that the IBO does have as those minor belts that are just belts from its own continent, I do love that idea. Like, if you have to defend the belt just a couple times or a few times, then you could do it. As of right now, guys, the closest person in the heavyweight to ever do that is, uh, unfortunately, Simone Keen. After he won the belt in June of 2017, he defended it a couple times in 2018, but he stripped the belt one week before Michael Hunter and the Martin Bacall fight, which Bacall lost. And one week before that fight, Simone lost his first fight. And then five years later, he lost against Joseph Parker. Blah, 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 blah. But, yeah. So, um, unfortunately, in the heavyweight division, a lot of people just don't think about defending this belt as much. They just strip it away, just like all those other belts that are just useless. So, yeah. But the IBO has been on a holding term. So, the last person that held the belt was back in November 6, 1998, where a tomato can fighter from the country of Denmark... Brian Nielsen already defeated Lionel Butler. He, def- he actually won a few other fights at the time. He was 49-0, and then he lost in the final round 10 knockout upset victory against, yeah, you guessed it, Dickie Ryan. Or Dickie. W- w- yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, pretty much, I just don't, it's, it's, a, it's a funny name. But unfortunately, after a year since that fight, he the belt was stripped away from him, and Lewis won. And as I said before, yep, yeah, he defeated Holyfield for it. Like the IBO was, to be honest, guys, the IBO belt was never involved in the first fight with Holyfield or Lewis. So for reasons why it was involved in the second fight, I'll never know. I just, guys. Can someone tell me why the IBO belt was involved in the second fight of the Holyfield versus Lewis match, but not in the first fight? I just don't get it. And as I said before, Michael Grant, Francis Bow, the David Tua, and both the Rotman Rotman fights, um, they all had their own upcomings. And like I said before, guys, Mike Tyson and Lewis, as I did talk about that in my WBC video. Um, in hindsight, guys, um, it's probably for the best to talk about Lennox Lewis. Like, I already talked about Lennox Lewis versus Mike Tyson fight in 2002. I already reviewed that on my WBC video. You can go check that out yourself. Now it's time for me to review the final fight for Lennox Lewis versus Vidui Kuchko. And pardon me. Pardon me if you just hear those sounds in the background. I'm sucking on a lifesaver right now to clear my throat so I won't have a sore throat because this is going to be a long podcast. Um, But anyway. So this fight, guys. So here's the story. 
Lennox Lewis is already trying to come back out of nowhere. Like Lennox Lewis has said this before in interviews, he did like like Lennox Lewis did say that he was already picturing retirement in his career at the at the time because he didn't want to retire from boxing yet until he takes on Mike Tyson. After that Hasim Rotman fight and everything else and how he won the title back and such. And of course, the Ring magazine also promoted that they they also fought for the vacant Ring magazine title with him and Tyson that same night for some weird reason. Also, that's another story I'm going to talk about later. But still, in hindsight, guys, this is the information I do find interesting. Now, as I forgot to mention, guys, um, Lennox Lewis already re- he already vacated his IBF belt, as I did say in the IBF story of how he vacated the belt. So the WBC and the ring title were the only two titles that were on the line for him and Vili Klitschko. And for reasons why is is obvious, because <laughs> technically, originally... Um, it did state that even though Lewis was planning on the fight um, probably one more time in 2003 after his Tyson win, he just decided not to fight in the IBF mandatory fighter. For reasons why, um, yeah, um, I don't know. Like For reasons why he picked a guy that was not in the IBF, because, as I said before, it did state it by September. Lewis vacated about refusing negotiations for mandatory challenger Chris Bird, which I guess because who wants to fight him? And by giving him being given $1 million and a Range Rover by promoter Don King to do so, because King wished to promote a fight between, between Bird and Evander Holyfield for the vacant belt. So... Yeah, take that for what you will. And, of course, Bird would win the title, and that's that. But for for reasons why they decided not to put him and Chris Bird on the line, because Chris Bird is already the hot commodity. He already took care of Vidui Klitschko. And now Lennox Lewis has taken on the guy that lost his fight against Chris Bird. So, but it doesn't make sense. So Vidui Klitschko is a dangerous fighter, and that's all that matters. So in the first round of the fight, pardon me. So in the first round, they they both they both started like in the first round. Uh, there's punches. There's there's some looping right hands. There's some fights upstairs. Both of these guys are just going at each other. They fight too close to each other. They clinch. They like they, they throw clinches on each other. Uh, Klitschko at the time, like Klitschko is in the aggressive zone. He's taking on a past prime fighter that's already past his prime with this. Like this isn't the Lennox Lewis that won fights in the 90s. This is a past prime Lennox Lewis. Same thing is for Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson fought against a guy named Clifford Utoon, however you spell his name, and won by first round knockout in that fight, which would be his final win in his career, because his last two fights would be a whole different ball game. But Lewis retired with a bang. So after the first round of competition, as said, they both um, go at each other, and mostly after round one, it came to a close. Come round two, mostly as it is, uh, Vidui is just being more of the aggressor in the fight as he did in round one. Like, like obvious, it was an obvious sign of winning, and he was on he was on the cusp for it. He was on a winning. He was on a winning end there. He was he was going at it like no other person did. But then, in round three is when things were changing for Lewis. Uh, Lewis gets up. Um, he, uh, 
he tries to um, reach a little bit of fortitude. Um, mostly, round three had to be the better round for Lewis and the only round that seemed like he might have won the fight. Maybe round five, because round five was a close round, but round three was a better round for Lewis. He managed to he managed to hold himself pretty well in the fight. Like, like anything in the third round Lewis did, it was a it was a pretty interesting fight. Because in the third round, they start out... Because in the third round, Lewis attacks Klitschko, backs him in the winter ropes. The crowd is going crazy. Um, I think I forgot to mention, in round two is when I think Klitschko got hurt or something. But I don't know. Um, mostly at the end of the day, Klitschko is throwing punches at each other. Uh, you can see the replay in the... Th- like, you can, like, when watching the third round of the fight, you can see Klitschko has... Um, some bloodiness on his left eye, the bottom of his left eye, that's cut, which is going to play a factor into the fight. Um, Klitschko throws like a, like four punches, four jabs with his left arm. He's throwing left, right hand to follow. But but Lewis throws his own power punches. He lands his own. And he's landing a lot more great counter punches than ever. Good jabs upstairs. Two punch combinations for Klitschko, and and again while the round is going, Klitschko's left eye is already in a bloody mess. After two rounds, you think to yourself, "This is all Klitschko." You come to round three, the fans are going wild. The, the fans are standing up, like this is a Ukrainian Ukrainian fighter taking on a past prime guy that has no chance of winning, in my opinion, and Lewis is already in the luckiness. Like, if he could just injure Klitschko more, this fight could end. But depending on if there's a technical decision, because Klitschko lost the first fight by dominating Chris Bird after 10 rounds, and the fight should have went to scorecards by technical decision, but there was no technical decision back then. Um, the bell rings for round three, and when the cornerman gets over there, they get a close-up of the gash on top of Lennox's, I mean, I mean, I mean, Vidui's eye, like, uh, it was so disgusting that the trainers had to put some of that, like, Vicks or something to rub it on his eye, like, God almighty. Oh, man. Ugh. Like, that, like, guys, seeing that first left-right combination punch Lewis did to him in the beginning part of that third round, which cause that cut yeah it it goes to show you guys like just because even if you're taking on the most dangerous or greatest fighter that's better than you doesn't mean that one punch can end it yeah because andy ruiz did that to uh aj in madison square garden in 2019 so hey you just you just don't know we come to round four and So in four in, in round four, so guys in round four they did not hesitate to go at each other. They were throwing barrage of punches at each other, and then suddenly Lewis is clinching at him, and while he's trying to put Vidui to the ropes, Vidui tries to throw a huge uppercut while close to him while they're in clinching ropes, and and then after they get the clinch done after they after the referee pulls them out, um, Klitschko out of nowhere ducks while Lewis throws his crazy left. And as he does that, Lennox has his arm inside Lewis's, like Lewis's head is inside Lewis's left armpit. And when it happens, they both fall to the ground. They fall down together. Lewis gets up and, um, and, but they continue with a punch. This time, like Vidui Kuchko manages to uh, get through the fourth round, but at this moment, the punching, the flurries, like there, there weren't no flurries, but the, the punch combinations, there was a lot of clinches. Like there wasn't a lot of clinches, like the Matty Eskin and Warren Okali, thank God, but or maybe not is worse than than you know, than that uh, South African dude taking on Lex Lewis back in ninety seven of you know how horrible that fight was, but I'm not gonna get to that. But yeah, this fight did have quenches around everywhere. 
uh, the bell would ring. With with with, with Quichko's eye badly cut, he had to survive the round. Um, and then you come to round five. We get this huge uppercut on with Lewis. Both of these two guys are throwing punch combinations at each other. Like Lewis, like Lewis attacks him. Vinwick attacks him back. Like they both go at each other like like it's a war. And uh, Lewis, like I said before, past his prime, he's still throwing good combinations. He's not landing a lot, but in this fifth round, it was pretty close to know who won the fight. Uh, again, the eye is bleeding, and they're not even halfway through. And then Klitschko does actually manage to wobble Lewis to the ropes. They clinch again, and the bell rings. It, it was a close round. Probably a video we Klitschko win. It, probably. Um, we come to round six. Round six would be the end of the round. Both guys are stunning each other. They they throw each other. They're throwing combination after combination. They are hitting. They're landing. Klitschko is hurting out Lewis so much. He's now. I I heard that Lewis is bleeding, but I couldn't tell by the graphic. I'm watching the camera because I heard that Lewis's face is pretty badly damaged as well. He's getting taken damage in round six. And while he's damaging Lewis's face, Lewis throws this amazing right uppercut, pounds him so hard. The crowd are standing up on their feet like crazy. Like, this is a war. That's all I can say. This is a war. <laughs> oh, like, a 37-year-old British former Canadian Olympian against a 31-year-old dude. This, uh, like, this... Quichko guy. Um, at this moment, the referee is a little bit concerned, but they can manage. They can continue to throw punches at each other. But the round ends. Quichko, a round for him. After six rounds, it's like 59 to 55, but all, but all judges believe it's 58 to 56 favored Quichko. But nah, it, 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 it's up to the viewers to decide. But the three judges all had 58 to 56. Quichko, I had 59 to 56. Um, But yeah, the cornerman would stop the fight. Quichko, Quichko's eye is damaged on. They get out of the ring. Quichko's upset. Like, Quichko's upset right now, and the commentators are just on it to each other. Like, like with everything going on, Lewis winning this fight, it was crazy. Like, um, I, I, there's just nothing much I can say. It, it is bad uh, when you look at it from a perspective. It is what it is. And, yeah, Quichko did what he had to do, but uh, at the end of the day, losing two fights considering he lost him in horrible fashion due to a shoulder injury and an eye injury. Like, it, it makes sense why people thought Klitschko Vidui is the greatest fighter, greater than his brother, because he was not a quitter. But due to some of the injuries that made him lost a fight, and he didn't lose those two fights by domination. He was leading by both scorecards in those championship fights. If technical decision were a factor at the time, then he would have been a champion. By the way, um, fun fact, uh, this fight was originally supposed to be scheduled to, uh, Lewis was originally supposed to fight Kurt Johnson, but he pulled out of the fight on June the 6th because of partial tear of his left uh, pectoral muscle. So Klitschko was scheduled to fight Cedric Boswell in the undercard of the Lewis and Johnson fight, but of course, the fight would be in contract for June the 9th, and so it was two weeks of notice. That this fight, so so this was just a two week replacement fight. This fight was never supposed to take place. This was supposed to be Kirk Johnson, but that never went to. Yeah, um, it, it is bad. As for everything else with money, um, HBO with four point six million homes watch this on HBO and World Championship Boxing. This was the highest rated fight since Oscar De La Hoya in the Oba Car in May 22nd, 1999 fight. Um, uh, considering how grotesque this fight was, and um, 
Also, it's stated that Harold Letterman actually had the fight 57 even after six rounds. Weird. So, there we go, guys. Uh, the end of the IBO is there. Nope. We would have to wait three years in the future where Chris Bird, IBF champion, takes on against Vladimir Klitschko. And the IBO, again, is on the line. Vacated. Three years ago, Lewis retains it against Vidui Klitschko. And Vlad wins it back, defeating a rematch, this time by knockout, against Bird. I just don't understand why. Um, now, as for everything else about uh, Vladimir Klitschko, because I've talked about the informations of the IBF and the WBO of the story of Vladimir Klitschko's title defenses and all their fights, and it's hard for me to tell which fights I have talked about, from Ray Austin to Amon Brewster and Tony Thompson to to friggin' Hasim Rotman and Eddie Chambers. Um, and even though there's still a couple other fights I do want to talk about, but that's going to be for the WBA time, I'm already going to save the wrestling, Ruslan Chavage and the um, Alexander Poviekin fight for Klitschko in another time for the WBA story because I have two chapters about that. Um and same thing for David Hay. So I'm I'm actually saving those fights for another time. Um, for history, guys, Vladimir Klitschko's title defense and his second title reign started all the way from Chris Bird in 2006. In the IBO, a belt was on the line. Um, it is, like, if it makes sense that maybe if... Vladimir Klitschko and Chris Bird were both in the top ranks in the IBO and they fought for that title because of it. It was vacant while they were fighting for the IBF. To be honest, it is crazy that the IBO was never much of a major because at this moment you think to yourself, it's more of a major title than the WBO. Like, I'm serious. It's, it's just ridiculous how... The IBO has been around for this much, just like the WBO, because they've been around since 1988, part of each other. Like I said, the IBF was around since 1983. <laughs> like, it's hilarious. <laughs> and um, I think when you look at it, from the perspective points of all these championship and the divisions and such, all these boxing organizations, because you have all these organizations around the world just kicking each other in the throat because it's, it's crazy. Because like I said before, like the WBA belt was mostly a championship since 1921 when it was formally known as the NAB, or I mean the, the NBA, National Boxing Association. And then in 62, it became WBA, World Boxing Association. And the WBC was never uh, never about until 63. Um, come 20 years later, it was IBF in 1983, and IBO and WBO were both belts in 88. Also, the WBF Feder World Boxing Federation was also a belt in 88. And now they're counting that as one of the prestige titles as of right now. Like, like, how can you be a fan of this? It's just crazy that this IBO belt has been involved in the undisputed, the road to the undisputed, since Lennox Lewis's win against Evander Holyfield. And now it's involved with Alexander Usyk and Tyson Fury. And no one talks about it. And guys, every time you watch a YouTube video of Rummy's Corner and he talks about the story and he's talking about these two fights, even before the undisputed fight of Fury and Usyk started, he talks about nothing but 
who's going to win the WBC, WBA, IBF, WBO, Wendio, and this or that. The super, he always will say the WBA is a super belt, but he never says one word about the IBO. Why? Like, what's the point of this belt being involved? Hey, guys. Just to make things interesting, before I get back to the Undisputed thing and the story, and like I said before, I'm already skipping everything about Vladimir Klitschko's title reigns because there's an, a lot to talk about of his title reigns. I, I already skipped the fight with him and Tyson Fury in 2015, so we're going to get to uh, the AJ and the and the Vladimir fight Um Soon, but before we get to that, here's the fighters that have won the championship belt. Plankton Thomas defeats Greg Payne by 12 round split decision in South Carolina on November the 14th, 1992. Um, and surprisingly, um, nothing much comes of it except mostly he would just strip the belt. For reasons why, who knows? A month later, Lionel Butler fights against Tony Willis. Uh, goes round five by TKO, California. He wins it. <laughs> Darnell Nicholson defeats John Ruiz by 12-round split decision on August the 4th, 1994. 18 months after Lionel Butler defeated Tony Willis. And Darnell Wilkinson wins. Surprisingly, he would relinquish that title in October. That same month, Australian fighter Jimmy Thunder, which might, I mean, New Zealand, my bad, Jimmy Thunder's New Zealand, which I think he might be the first ever to win a world heavyweight title before Lucas Brown, if this, if this IBO belt will be major in the future, he wins the belt, and surprisingly, he retains it. He defeats Tony Tubbs, Ray Anus, which is... Some interesting fights there. Also, Jimmy Thunder is famous for that crazy one-punch hit that sent the fighter down round one and it ended in 11 seconds by first round. Man, I wish that fight ended sooner if the referee just shouldn't have counted. He just should have just waved off the fight, the same way as how Senecia Strada knocked out that Miranda fighter in 2020 in seven seconds for how, for how much of a horrible fight that was to look at. And then Jimmy Thunder, he vacates the belt after his August the 8th, 1995 win, or as on why well, he mostly vacated away um, a little bit sooner, maybe later, who knows, because it said that he, was, he stripped the title on July the 16th, 1995, which was actually a couple weeks before his fight against Ray Anus that was for the title. So continuity problem there? Was that was that an air problem? Who knows? With everyone knowing the story, Brian Nielsen defeats Tony La Rosa in January 12th, 1996. The first fighter from Denmark wins a title. Dude, if this belt ever becomes major in the future... Like, just talk about this Denmark fighter that actually became an undefeated guy, taking on past prime contenders and such, and, fi and fights that were fixed. They build up this tomato can guy to fight 49 fights, and a bunch of them were against crazy fighters that were nobodies. Phil Jackson, Mike Hunter, in 1996, he defended that belt two months in March 29th, May the 31st. And around this time, like, it, he would actually fight several fights a month. Like, he would sometimes fight two or three fights in every several months. But a lot of those fights were in eight rounds or six round fights or ten rounds. He wasn't fighting for the world title or even retaining them. He was fighting nobodies. Just like that, just like that fighter in the minimum weight division, which I might talk about that story for another time, so I'll keep it secret. It takes him several months, from May the 31st to January the 21st, after his win against Mike Hunter in his title defense, like, he built up 
from September 13th, a win against nobody, nobody, Marcus Rhodes, maybe a somebody in November. He gets three of those fights. Comes January, he gets a controversial split decision win against Larry Holmes, past prime fighter. Yeah, which is his toughest and greatest win of all time. Then he takes on nobody fighters. Well, he does take on a guy named Damon Reed that was 18 and 0 at the time, back in May the 2nd, 97. So, eh, it's an, it was an interesting fight. But then after that, every fight he takes on is nobodies. Like Crawford Grimsley, former contender that lost against Foreman in Japan in 96. He loses another fight only to lose against Brian Nielsen. Uh, and then he takes on this guy named Don Steele, which I have heard information of, of a 41-0 and 0 guy that's known for taking on nobodies. Guys, Don Steele might be one of the worst hype job contenders in the heavyweight division. Don't look up who Don Steele is. Don't type in D-O-N space S-T-E-E-L-E. He is the worst heavyweight boxer of all time. Just don't look him up. I did, and it was worse. And information about him and such, it's, he's, a, he's a bum. A hype job bum. A bigger hype job bum than Ty Fields, Peter McNeely, or even David Nino Rodriguez. And those are boxers I might talk about in the future for how hype job they are. Or even bigger than Dwayne Dobbick, which don't look him up neither. He's a bum as well. Or even Trevor Bryan. That's what he is. And that, that, that was also for the heavyweight title. This 41-0 dude got his butt beat by Brian Nielsen in round two by KO. His 41-0 went down the toilet the same way as how Ken Norton defeated Dwayne Dobbick when he had over... 30 wins in his career and lost in the first round in less than a minute. You can tell how Brian Nielsen's record resume has. Even though there were times that he took on a couple other undefeated fighters, defended his belt again, 98 against Lionel Butler, as I talked about before, and defeated Peter McNeely in February and Tim Witherspoon in April the 16th in 1999, only two months later, and take on Dickie Ryan, and Dickie got him, defeated him in the tenth and final round in TKO fashion. Unbelievable. And that was the end of how Brian Nielsen's career went down the toilet. Yes, he won a couple other interesting fights in 2000 in his career until 2001. He lost against Mike Tyson. His career came to an end. Won a couple more fights, took on Uriah Grant, a hype job journeyman, former heavyweight cruiserweight champion. And then nine years later, he takes on Holyfield, and that was his dead career. Yeah. So the IBO belt is just a bummed belt, and it's being involved in this whore title. Ridiculous. So the fight itself in April 29th against Anthony Joshua was the stuff of legends. Joshua defeated out Klitschko in round 11 by TKO. He went on against this guy like crazy. He knocked him down in round five. And in round six, Klitschko went, oh, just knocked out Joshua for the first time in his career. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, that's the end of Joshua. And Klitschko won the fight. And don't get me wrong, Klitschko, after having problems in the first fights of that, uh, it was crazy. And he came back from round seven to round eight. And, and he, he was even thrown in great stuff in round nine, which I think that Joshua won that round and round 10 when round 10 came and and Joshua was out of it I thought he was a he was a goner <laughs> and even though the scorecards a couple of them had favor for Joshua one had for Klitschko after 10 rounds but man oh man guys I have stuff to say about the 11th round and I'm gonna talk about the 11th round right now and um I'm just gonna say it right now what I feel about this fight <sighs> Round 11. Round 11. So both guys get up onto each other. And... The round starts. Joshua attacks out Klitschko. He hurts Klitschko for some reason, but I don't think nothing much. There, weren't, there wasn't much injury into that. And then he backs Klitschko in the ropes. And then one minute into the fight... Out of nowhere, they both punch, throw, jabs, clinch. And um, every time they throw, punch, and so, they do clinch. But then, past the one-minute mark, um, Klitschko throws a right. Joshua ducks. Um, 
uh, Quichko is trying to quench, like he's trying to quench AJ. AJ throws a left punch and he kind of, when he does, he grabs the back of Quichko's head, almost like George Foreman does with his opponents. When he grabs the back of his head, AJ out of nowhere picks up that right hand and oh, hooks him on his chin. The Oh, that was the nastiest punch I've ever seen Joshua ever threw. And it stumbled Quichko out of his... It, it, he was done. He was done. He hurt Quichko so much that he brought him down and the crowd was out of it. Seconds later, with one minute, 20 seconds left of the fight, he backs him into the ropes. Quich goes down again. <sighs> And with 50 seconds left of the fight, Joshua backs him out to the rope, but Quichko goes to the left. He goes to the other side of the corner rope. He throws punch after punch, and the referee stops the fight with, with less than 40 seconds left of the fight. I'll be honest, though, that was a great fight. Looking back at that fight today, it was pretty good. <sighs> As for everything else about Joshua's boxing career in his reign... His fight against Carlos Tacom and how that was a rate replace, late replacement and how that fight was just... Uh, and talk about how Joseph Parker and Joshua fight and how that fight became an amazing to talk about. And saying about the Poviekin fight and and then how he had that, 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 that two fight with him and Ruiz in 2019. Um, and I did talk about the fight with Kubrat Poev and how that fight went... Um, was there anything to say about the Alexander Usyk fight win after he defeated AJ? Not really. Guys, there's not a lot of information to talk about the IBO belt. I think I just talked about the whole history of the heavyweight championship belt of the IBO. And guys, I've only been recording for 42 minutes of this podcast, and I feel like I should be done with the podcast. To be, to be honest, guys, I think I'm already done talking about this because... Because after all of this, guys, I think that's it for this podcast. But guys, before I end it in a couple minutes, I'll end it until it hits 45 minutes. i just like to say that even though Usyk's win against Joshua was great, because the first fight was pretty obvious, <sighs> like, I just don't think AJ was at his game in the first fight. Because he was already taking his time. He was taking it easy. He found his new boxing strategy of punching the glove to back up Andy Ruiz every time he goes for the attack. He does that with Kubrat Polev. He did that with Alexander Usyk in their first meeting. Uh, AJ just wasn't cut out into those fights. He was a completely different AJ. And I just didn't like much of his strats. And even after their rematch in 2022, it, it was obvious. Like If your viewers do watch the fight, you'll understand what I'm talking about when what I'm talking about of AJ punching the glove, pushing the glove back every time AJ or Andy goes through the attack. And you, you viewers will understand. Everything about that is crazy. And even though I am going to talk about the Darren DeBlois and Alexander Usyk fight in the next video of the WBA, yeah. Um, to be honest, guys, with Tyson Fury and the Alexander Usyk fight and how Usyk won... No one talks about the IBO as much. <laughs> like, guys, if no one talks about the IBO, why not just strip the IBO belt? Like, why does no one think about to themselves, hey, this IBO is a waste of time? If it's not talked about, why not just strip the belt? Like, if you're trying to save money on paying sanction fees for holding these titles and the IBO is not a thing, why not strip it? It's like, yeah. Why did they make him keep the IBF belt before the Phil Perkovich and Darren DeBlois fight? I don't know. What's the point of having this IBO belt? I don't know, and I'm just going to stick to it because at the end of the day... I, guys, just let me know in the comments, guys, because I'm curious to find out. That's all. So there you have it, guys. That is the story to the road to the Undisputed Heavyweight Championship Part Chapter 4, the IBO. So thank you very much for watching this episode I still have three more to talk about. Uh, next time, I'm going to be talking about the WBA Super Duper Heavyweight Champion, even though that 
belt hasn't been around since 2011. So that's going to be another episode that's going to be quicker than this episode I just did. Part 6 will be the WBA regular heavyweight champion. And Part 7 will be the finale of the lineal champion. So thank you for watching this video. And with that, as always, Fox Wolf, out.